בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, שלום וברכה, חברים יקרים. We are here back in the holy city in Jerusalem, ברוך השם, uh, under uh, the uh, war uh, that uh, from one end seems to be uh, intensifying as far as the opinions, but uh, as far as the, uh, what's going on out there, it seems like it's uh, winding down after the uh, visit by the uh, President of the United States, uh, Joe Biden. So, uh, you know, some people are uh, optimistic that Israel is going to continue the war until they finish the job, while others are uh, very pessimistic now that there was a certain uh, uh, amount of money given to the uh, Palestinians now and uh, all types of other things. Anyway, we still have to do what we do, which is to learn Torah in order to win the spiritual war. Because at the end of the day, every war... Uh, that's uh, you know that's in this world. It's only after there's a spiritual war above, from the angels that uh, oversee each nation, and uh, this war was not something that just came out of nowhere. And one of the things that we'll discuss tonight, as a uh, chesed and uh, uh, show of gratitude to uh, one of the gedolim in the past generation, Rav Vigdo Miller is to enlighten you about the Torah of Rav Vigda Miller that uh, perhaps you never heard of. Uh, and uh, tonight's you will be for the Refua Shlema uh, and Atzlacha Rabba for Moreno Verabeno Rav Ephraim Kachlon, uh, Rabbanit uh, Levan Bat Sara, Rabbanit uh, Sara Bat Anat, Avimori David Ben Esriya, Imimorati Doris Bat Jora, and uh, also for all of those that have been uh, traumatized, uh, injured, uh, and hurt in any way, shape, or form by these evil monsters that call themselves Palestinians uh, with uh, different uh, uh, militant groups like Hamas. And for anyone out there that believes that Hamas and the Palestinians are two separate entities, you're simply fooling yourself. Uh, Israelis know very well who their enemy is, uh, and uh, no one can tell them otherwise. Anyway... We are uh, in a situation now that uh, there has been an enormous amount of spiritual yearning over this last couple of weeks. Uh, as the sages say that Haman, Haman Arasha, who wanted to destroy Am Yisrael, still had merit because he, uh, let, you know, he caused Am Yisrael to get so scared from being annihilated that Am Yisrael did tshuva. Am Yisrael is a whole dead tshuva, and uh, because of that, the Gemara says that uh, the descendants of Haman uh, converted to Judaism and became big rabbis in Bnei Brak. Uh, and uh, some Chachamim uh, have uh, actually, uh, some of the sages in the Gemara uh, discuss it and even mention one of the names, uh, I believe it's Rabbi Simlai, that's actually the descendant of Haman. Point being is, is that after you have such a spiritual awakening, uh, in the last couple of weeks, you have to take advantage of it because there's an enormous amount of people that are watching Shiwet Torah that we have. Uh, and uh, I'm also finding out from our different groups, uh, language groups, that uh, it's uh, catapulted in a positive way uh, over these last couple of weeks in uh, other languages. Uh, our uh, Russian channel is uh, blowing up over 100,000 views just in the last 48 hours. Uh, and uh, thousands of people are signing up to the channel to watch Rabbi Leib uh, and his shurim, watch some of my shurim that were translated to, uh, to Russian. So, Bo Hashem, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's amazing how many people are watching Hebrew, English, Russian, Spanish, Portuguese, all of these different languages where they're getting the truth. So on that end, we're, uh, we're getting people to do tshuva, we're getting people to keep Shabbat, we're getting people to uh, do all types of very, very good things. But at the same token... A person has to be aware that uh, if you know the, the spiritual awakening is not going to wait for you, and you have to take advantage of certain things. And uh, if you're not fighting the battle for the sake of Am Yisrael, then the Satan already won because the Satan has soldiers that are fighting for him every single time. Uh, that uh, they have an opportunity, which is pretty much 24 hours a day. And uh, one of the things that the uh, Zohar Kadosh tells us is that at the end of days, many of the teachers out there uh, are going to be part of the Erev Rav. They're going to be part of the Erev Rav, where they're going to change the truth. 
They're going to distort the truth, like some of the heretics that we've spoken about in the past. But even if someone was a, uh, a tzaddik that taught the truth, that did all the right things, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, his Torah is going to continue flourishing after he dies, uh, you know, because his students will do him justice. Because sometimes, the uh, you know, when the rabbi... Uh, passes away, the students weaken. And even if they don't necessarily mean uh, bad, the Yetzirah convinces them that uh, perhaps the rabbi was great in his generation, but now we have to, you know, take things and match them to the current generation. And in so many words, sugarcoat the holy words of the Rav. Now, as I've told you many times, if anyone reads some of the books of G'dolei Israel from the pre previous generations, whether you're going to be looking at directly into the Mishnah and the Gemara, or you're going to look at the different parts of the Zohar, you're not going to uh, 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 spend too much time uh, looking for the truth because you'll see it right in your in every single page. There's, uh, the uh, reward and judgment is constantly mentioned in one way or another. But when you go into the world of the Rishonim, 800, 900 uh, years ago, you're going to see clear truth of what reward and punishment is, as the uh, Ramban writes in Shah uh, in, uh, in the uh, seventh section over there, talks about reward and punishment, and anyone that says that the maximum judgment is only 12 months is a heretic, and he speaks very, very zealously about uh, what the truth is and what the falsehood is. And this continues for hundreds and hundreds of years, uh, but uh, at some point, the in combination of the Enlightenment movement and also the, uh, the Yetzirah attacking even the world of the Yeshivot has somehow convinced people that uh, the topic of reward and punishment, specifically referring to the topic of Genom, apparently doesn't leave the border of Israel, meaning you can learn about Genom in Israel, from the teachers in Israel, from the rabbis in Israel. But once you leave the border, you go to, you know, you leave Israel, you go to uh, the UK, you go to America, you go to Canada, you go to all of these different countries. Apparently, no, uh, no teacher wants to speak about Genom. Until you have great Chachamim, like uh, Arav Vigdo Miller, who comes in and tells you, no, no, even though I live in the exile, that doesn't mean that the Torah is from the exile. It's the same holy Torah, and he spoke the words of truth that uh, woke up a lot of people, uh, perhaps many more people after he passed away from this world than even while he was alive. But needless to say, he, will, he built an empire of Torah. But despite this empire of Torah, where there are many, many books out there and newsletters that people get every day where they take different excerpts of the things that he said, the truth is that the core foundation of the teachings of Rabbi Vigdor Miller are not going to be something you're going to find uh, easily, at least online, in a newsletter, uh, and uh, quite frankly, unless you study his books, you're going to miss it. You're going to miss it because the Yetzirah has convinced people that even the great Rabbi Vigdor Miller has to be censored in this generation if you're going to teach it to the people of the exile, as if people are spiritually retarded. Now, the truth is, Rabotai Karim, anyone that wants the truth can have it very easily, and anyone that wants falsehood can also have it easily. And this shiu is for those people that want the truth. If you want the truth, if you want to understand what one of the G'dolei Israel actually said what he built his empire of Torah uh, upon, then uh, tune in and you'll understand and you'll see sources and page numbers as Baruch Hashem, Be'agelen Kodesh and our holy work. We always want to give you guys word for word what the sages said without necessarily uh, confusing it with our opinion. Anytime that we're going to add something from ourselves uh, or uh, Rav Ephraim, uh, certainly you're going to be uh, notified of it. But the key is to understand is that Sometimes when a person reads a book, sometimes when a person reads an article, uh, they, uh, they don't realize that uh, the key point is being missed if you don't pay close attention to it. 
And this is why, despite the fact that the uh, uh, Anglo-Judaism or American Judaism or whatever you want to call it, uh, cooled down already at the time of Rav Vigdo Miller, he himself was a fire burning of holy Torah, and uh, he did not allow himself to be censored in any way, shape, or form. And for that, he merited to build the empire that he did. And if you notice, the heretics that uh, went against the truth, no one even knows who they are in this generation. Once they leave this world, the memory of them leaves. Uh, you know, whereas the, the holy people, whether it's the Chafetz Chaim, or Rav Vassalmena Alav Shalom, or it's a uh, Rav uh, Nisim Yegen, or all of the Chachamim, Rav uh, uh, Ovadia, all of these giants, uh, they're... It's not just people remember them and their pictures and a couple of stories, but their Torah is still alive and well as if they're publishing books today. As if they're publishing books today. And the important thing to know is that when one wants to have a Rav, that they say, this is my Rav, they have to understand that that means that you listen to everything that that Rabbi says. So that means that if you consider Rav Vigdor Miller your Rabbi, that means that you not only have to learn, read, watch everything that he said, but even more so, you have to do it. You have to do everything possible to publicize it. And you can't censor anything. And you can't say, no, you know what? This article is a little too strong. I'm not going to send it to my friend. This one is not. You can't do any of that stuff. Once the rabbi says, that's it. It's, it's, a, uh, it's like Moshe Rabbeinu said it at Mount Sinai. But again, it's a... Uh, Sad that uh, there is a lot of censoring today, whether intentional or unintentional is irrelevant. We certainly know that the intentional and the unintentional uh, are still the uh, uh, censoring of Torah, is still the works of the Satan. And that's why as a, uh, as, as, as a, a karata tov for what we've learned uh, from Avigdor Miller and, and a karata tov to HaKadosh Baruch Hu for, for putting us in the world of Torah, we have to make sure that the truth is out there. And uh, understand where people really are versus where people really think they are. Now, uh, Rav Vigdor Miller, Allah Shalom, wrote Baruch Hashem, had many speeches, which you know, many of them turned into many books. And uh, as a side note, the first book that I got uh, from Rav Ephraim to read when I uh, first started doing tshuva was Rav Vigdor Miller's book. And at that time, it was very, very dense, very heavy book, even though it was a heavy reader for other material, uh, you know, business and the likes, uh, philosophy and all types of things I studied throughout all my life. Uh, once I was introduced to the world of Torah, the first book I got was Rabbi Victor Miller's book. And for me, it was very difficult because I didn't realize that this is not just intellectual, this is also a spiritual war. And this is one of the things that Rabbi Victor Miller knew very, very well. Hence the reason of why he fought against this censoring, this political correctness, tooth and nail, and wrote about it extensively throughout practically every one of his books. And we're going to mention just, again, a tidbit of it. We're not going to mention all of it because that literally will take days. We're going to mention a tidbit of it. It may take a while, but that, that tidbit is still going to be significant. So you exactly know what... Rav Victor Miller taught about Gehenom. So you know that even if you read a few motivating write-ups by him or that were you know, uh, transcribed from his lectures or uh, something that uh, focused on perhaps uh, Zionism or anti-Zionism, I should say, or something that focused on having emuna, or something that focused on you know, being a decent person, uh, de- it's all good. It's all fantastic but it's not the foundation of what Rav Vigdor Miller taught. It's not the reason, these, these articles are good, but they're not the, one, they're not the reason why Rav Vigdor Miller was a Torah powerhouse in this world and the next. So we'll start off with letting you know that these books, when we're quoting them, we're quoting the Hebrew version. Meaning that if you open the same exact book in English, it may not be the same page number. It may be off by a few pages. It won't be significantly off. It won't be like a hundred pages difference. It may be a couple of pages off. In Sefer O Olam, fourth chapter, page 170, Victor Miller gives us the basic foundation of all of his teachings. 
where he constantly used as a bal musal, he used things that a person can see and feel in order for them to understand the word of God. And he says, anything that you encounter with by using your five senses is something good for helping your avodat Hashem. Anything that you're able to see, hear, any uh, speak, smell, these are things that Hashem is giving you, not only for their plain reason of what it seems like, but rather for you to serve Hashem through it. As an example, says the Rav, fire. Fire shows you what happens in heaven, meaning in the, not in heaven, Gan Eden, but heaven in, meaning in Shemaim, in the future to the people who forsake the Torah. And one can imagine if the burning pain of this fire that you're seeing, of this fire that you, uh, that you perhaps felt if you burned your finger, and one can imagine if this burning pain that he had by, let's say, if he burned a small, uh, his, his finger, it hurts a lot, he says. Imagine if that burning in the finger lasted one hour or one week. Or years or forever imagine a person got burned either he touched a hot pot or his finger went into a instead of him grabbing the hot dog he grabbed the fire in a barbecue but that burn didn't just burn quickly and you pulled away Rather, that burn continued for an hour. Can somebody imagine that? A week? Months? Years? Forever? Says the Rabbi Victor Miller. Each burn here is only one sixtieth of the pain of the burn in Genom. For example, for Lashon Ara, one can imagine putting his tongue on a burning pot for many long years because that's what will happen. Here the Rav is telling you, don't just read about reward and punishment. Don't just listen to it, but rather create an image but an image that you can relate to, an image that you can understand, because that will help you a lot. In the book Leva Vigdo, in a section called The Gate of Choice, or Bechira, in page 167, the Rav brings the Gemara in Maseret Eruvin, page 19a, which asks, why is Geenom called Geenom? Because it's a place gay that people go for chinam, for worthless endeavors. Because the desires are never as great as the yetzerah, the evil inclination makes them out to be. And there are one big lie. All of these desires, somebody's chasing women, somebody's chasing money, somebody's chasing all of these different things and forsaking the word of Hashem in the process. All of it is one big lie because once a person actually has that desire that he wanted, he realizes that it's never what he thought it was going to be. Never. Absolutely never. And even the natural desires are exaggerated much more than reality. And Rabbi Ephraim adds, think of a wicked person going down to Genom and one of the people managing Genom over there says, why are you going to Genom? His response is, for nothing worthwhile. Going to Genom because he cheated on his wife. That's why he's going to Genom. He had a girlfriend on the side, wasting seed, immorality, adultery. 
all types of horrible things. So he's going to get home. What do you have now that you are here? What do you have any good memories from this uh, adulterous relationship? No. Did it work out? Did you end up getting married with her? No, she ended up cheating on me. And what happened with your wife? Oh, she, she also left me. Meaning I ended up losing in both worlds. Why are you going to get home? Oh, because I uh, cheated in business. I uh, took people and I convinced them to borrow money at a very, very high interest without really explaining them to them that it's really a predatory loan. And uh, I'm going to get home for it. Is any of the money that you made, the millions that you made, came with you here? You're going to benefit from it? No. Did you at least benefit from it in the regular world? Because no, eventually I lost everything. I gambled everything, snorted a bunch of drugs, ended up destroying my life, ended up doing all types of horrible things, became an evil person. So this is really just my first sentence, just for the business itself. I'm not done with the rest of the stuff. Oh, see, so you're going to get enough for nothing? Like, nothing? Like, it wasn't even like something that you could say, you know what, I did it, and I could take it with me somewhere. And all of the sins are like this. And that's what Rav Vigdor Miller says. When they say that Gehenom is called the place that people go for worthless endeavors, for nothing, he says this is what it is, because the Yetzirah convinces you to do all types of things, but you realize at one point that it's all one big lie. And therefore, Rav Ephraim adds and says that your greatest desire loses value after you imagine if you had to get your finger burned for only five minutes. And therefore, the more one will use his five senses to imagine Gehenom, like Rabbi Victor Miller says, the more success he'll have in staying away from sins. Here, Rabbi Ephraim is clarifying how to implement the first point that Rabbi Victor Miller said. He said, I have an image, picture yourself burning your finger. I'm sure it's happened to some of you. You burned your finger, got electrocuted, something. Everybody understands pain to a certain extent. Some of us more than others. But usually the pain is an instant, it's gone. And even if there's more pain after it, it's not the same as the original pain. But I think the Miller says, no, no, no. Remember the original pain? Think of that. Of how it continues, not for a second. And you have a reflex and you pull away. But rather for five minutes. Just five minutes. We're not talking about even forever. Five minutes. Five minutes of that pain. For any particular sin that you're making. Immediately, the desire that you have for the forbidden woman, for wasting seed, for stealing, for, for eating non-kosher, for lying, for saying Lashon Ara, for wearing immodest clothes, for anything that the Torah says it's forbidden, the second you think of your finger, just your finger, being burned for five minutes, immediately the desire <whistles> dissipates and turns to nearly nothing. And then you forget about that thought and then the desire tries to attack again. And therefore in the book, Share Ora, Rav Victor Miller says in page number 87, in a section called Avodat Atziyu, Servitude through imagery. The Rav says the holy sages taught us different types of images to learn from for the sake of learning about Gehenom and at all stages of death. As the Gemara in Masechet Brachot, page 57b says, that the fire of Gehenom is 60 times greater than the fire here. So you'd have an imagery to learn that when you see fire, you should use it to think about the punishment of Gehenom. And Rav Sadia Gaon, in his Sefer Emunat, Emunot Udeot, in Chelek Dalet Otbet, fourth uh, section, uh, uh, fourth chapter, uh, second section, says that all images of sorrow in this world are measured against the images of greater sorrow in Gehenom. And therefore, says Rav Vigdo Miller, it's an obligation for us to use this strategy of imagery regularly. If one suffered burning by 
touching something hot, like a hot pot, or burning his finger, or another type of suffering on a small body part. He should use this image and imagine that if this is the suffering for just a small body part that's limited, how much more awful is the suffering of the fire of Gehenom that's burning the entire body? And even when he sees, the Rav continues, or hears about the suffering of other people, as all of us are hearing about what happened over the last couple of weeks when these murderous monsters, Palestinian terrorists, murdered a couple of thousand of our people and did all types of heinous things to them. You hear about it. Says Rav Vido Miller, use that for the sake of serving HaKadosh Baruch Hu by imagining Gehenom in your mind. And Rav, Rav Ephraim adds, you see the suffering that happened to those poor people last week? You see the suffering that's happening now? Whatever type of suffering, whether it's in a hospice or it's a murder, terrorism, all these things, Rav Ephraim says, you see that suffering? Think of it, imagine it, but just know it's going to be worse than that. Genom is worse than whatever you're seeing. But at the very least, you'll have some type of imagery. It's going to be worse than that for the sinners. And Rav Victor Miller continues and says that Rav Yehucham Leibovich, Allah Shalom, the Mashkiach of Yeshivat Mir, the Mir Yeshiva, also went in this direction of thinking and teaching. And when Hitler, Imach Shimo, was put in power, Rav Leibovitch said that due to the people forgetting of Gehenom that's in the next world, the creator, the Borei Olam, brought Gehenom into this world. Hashem Yishmo B'Yatzil. This is all in Sharei Ora, page 87. Next, we're going to go to the Sefer called Torah Avigdo. First chapter, page 47. The Rav says, regarding the fire of Gehenom being 60 times the, f- the fire here, it is so critical for our understanding and imagery of what Gehenom is. Because the knowledge of what Gehenom is keeps a person on a straight path. The Yesod, meaning the foundation of Yirat Shamaim, a fear of heaven, is knowledge of Gehenom. As the sages teach us in Pirkei Avot, in the Mishnah in Pirkei Avot, chapter 4, Mishnah number 22, don't let the Yetzirah convince you that the grave shall be a refuge for you. Know that there will be a judgment for your actions. There is Gehenom after death. And one must have an image of what is Gehenom. If you could make a drawing of it, a video of it, a movie of it, whatever you can do to help you understand what Gehenom is and have an image of it, it's fantastic. Meaning, if Rav Victor Miller was with us right now, he would be the number one promoter of the Gehenom film, more than even us. Because that's his shita. That's what he learned from Rav Leibovitch. That's what he learned from everything that he knew. Because otherwise, says Rav Victor Miller, how could one feel that there's Gehenom if you don't have an image of it? And therefore, fire gives us an image of what is Gehenom. Now, before we continue this point of what he writes, we have to go back to the Mishnah that the Rav brought. The Mishnah in Perkei Avot, in chapter 4, verse number, uh, uh, Mishnah number 22, is one of the foundational Mishnayot that every person really should remember by heart. But the section that the Rav brings is a section that not only teaches us about not to live in illusion and think that once you finish this life, 
death is a, which is inevitable for all of us, but death will end your problems. That's what suicidal people think. They think that once they die, that's it, their problems are over. They don't realize that their problems will grow exponentially if they kill themselves. And needless to say, a person that is not Torah observant thinks that, okay, once they die, they die. That's it, it's the end. Wrong. Don't think that the death will bring you a refuge. But furthermore, the Rav quotes this Mishnah because he's also fighting against the heretics. The heretics that will tell you that God needs you or God can't judge you. As the Mishnah itself says, literally, the Mishnah reads, Do not let your evil inclination convince you that the grave shall be a refuge for you, for you were created against your will and you were born against your will. And you will remain alive against your will. And you shall die against your will. And in the future, against your will, you will give an accounting and a reckoning before the King of Kings, the Holy One, blessed be He. That's only the second half of the Mishnah, but that's the point that we're focusing on. Meaning, if somebody tells you, listen, I just read a book by some heretic, and they don't call him a heretic, but we know it's a heretic because he calls the book, I didn't ask to be born. And therefore, God can judge me. The Mishnah and Masechet Avot, the foundation of our oral Torah says, don't ever think like that. Why not? Because although you're saying you didn't have to be here, you want to be here. Once you're here. And that's what the Gaon Mivilna comments on this Mishnah and says that the evil inclination promises that a person after his departure from this world will rest in peace. You know how people put R.I.P. Oh, rest in peace. As if he's sleeping. He's having a nap. Nice sleep. Maybe nice dreams. He's flying with the angels over the uh, clouds. Eating sugar candy. Talking to the moon and the sun. You know, like uh, some type of care babes, care bear. That's what the evil inclination wants you to think. But the Gaomi Vilna says, the Gaomi Vilna says, ay, 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 what the Gaomi Vilna says. The Gaomi Vilna says that the Yitzhak is going to tell you that the grave shall be a refuge for you and that you don't need to give a reckoning for your deeds before the heavenly court. One second, we see that we have a little bit of an issue on the uh, online. So the Gaumi Vilna says, the Yetzirah, the evil inclination is going to convince you that once you pass away, you don't have to worry about anything. There's no judgment. There's no day of reckoning for all of the things you did. You finish your life. You had a good time. Didn't have a good time. Doesn't make a difference. It's done. Kobe Villain says that's what the Yetzirah is going to try to make you think. And sometimes the Yetzirah is going to have soldiers that have beards longer than mine, hats, and different positions, popularity, invitations for major organizations and synagogues. The Yetzirah has many, many messengers. They're going to try to convince you that if you died, you're going to heaven. Why? Because you're a Jew. What about the fact that you didn't practice Judaism? What about the fact that you are a wicked Jew? What about the fact that you didn't do what Judaism actually says to do and the only thing that was Jewish about you was the uh, perhaps the cemetery that you were buried in. What about that? No, no, he's a Jew. Therefore, he goes to heaven. 
the Yetzirah, the evil inclination is going to try to convince you that you're going to become a care bear. Fly in the clouds, eating sugar candy, talking to the moon and the sun, riding the clouds. Don't believe it. What's the argument? Says the Gomi Vilna. The argument that they're saying is that because you were created against your will and born against your will and remained alive against your will, everything was done against your will, so you can't be held accountable for what you did in your lifetime. Meaning, I didn't ask to be born, says the heretic. I didn't ask to live. Since I didn't ask for this, therefore you can't hold me accountable for doing whatever I wanted. And therefore the Mishnah says, says the Gaumi Vilna, and warns us, do not let your evil inclination convince you that the grave shall be a refuge for you. For you are created against your will and you will die against your will. But if you should become sick and bedridden, God forbid, you show your fear of death, meaning you want to live, and you call upon the best doctors, and you would give them all of your money to save your life, and you do so because you wish to enjoy a long life, demonstrating that your will truly is to remain alive, and therefore you will be judged and have no choice but to give an accounting for all your deeds before the king of kings. Meaning even though you were created Against your will, once you were created, you wanted to live. Now, one of the amazing relationships that we read about different times is the relationship between the Gaomi Vilna and the Magid Midovna. Both of them were Torah giants, but of course, the Magid Midovna were the Magid. He was a Kiruv rabbi going from community to community, literally waking up, waking up sleeping souls and people were crying in his lectures. And the Magid Bidovna and the Gomi Vilna were close. So when the Magid heard the Rav say this, he says, do I have the permission to elaborate on your words with an analogy? He always had an analogy for something. He had a gift. A gift from heaven that literally everything you can put into a perspective that's the easiest thing in the world to understand. And he says the following. And this is brought... In the Sefer Anaf Etz Abod by Rabbi Vod Yosef, Allah wa Shalom. The Bagim Yudubna says, imagine that there was a wealthy man and he had two daughters. Two daughters. One of them was really, really ugly. Horrible. Something like she had no body or the image of a body and no face and you're not even sure what creature she was. And the other one it's just a nasty, nasty person. Literally, people were scared to just even stand next to her because of the vile mouth that she had. But this wealthy man wanted to get them both married. But no one wanted to marry them. So until he found this Shatchan that had some expertise and liked money, and he said, I found the perfect match for both of your daughters. Ooh, great, fantastic. The one that's really ugly, I found her the perfect mate. He's a good guy, decent family, but the best thing about him is he's blind. He's blind, so he won't be able to see how hideous she is. The one that uh, people don't like so much, I found her the best match. Nice guy, decent family, but the best thing about him is he's deaf. So he won't hear any of the vile things that come out of our mouth and complaints and cursing and ugh. Perfect matches. We should do a double wedding. And so this is what happens. They have the wedding and everybody's happy, fantastic. Tons and tons of money is spent and then they get married and everyone lives happily. The one that's blind doesn't know how ugly his wife is, so he's happy with her. The one that is deaf doesn't know what is coming out of his wife's mouth and how she's cursing him every two seconds. So he's happy also. Until one day, they both hear about a world-renowned doctor that's coming to town and has the ability to cure both of their illnesses. And since, of course, they're both the son-in-laws of a wealthy man, they can pay whatever price he's asking for. 
And the doctor says, I can cure both of you in one day. So, both go to the doctor. And lo and behold, they get out of the anesthesia. And the blind man can see. The deaf man can hear. And they're both excited. And they both go home. And ay ay ay, once they go home, tragedy strikes. The blind man sees how ugly and hideous his wife is. He's not sure whether to cry or to vomit. He doesn't know what to do. Ah, what's going on here? This is it. Oh, man. The guy that's deaf, he's happy to go see his wife until she starts cursing him and yelling at him. And he hears her voice and it's so annoying and it never stops. And she won't let him study. And she won't let him sleep. She won't let him eat. And she just doesn't stop yapping do, 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 like a machine. If she was a machine gun, it would actually be some mercy because it would end at some point. And both of them literally cannot wait to go the next day to the doctor and complain to him. What'd you do to us? You ruined our life. The doctor said, what are you talking about? I cured both of you. It's, you guys have to pay me. They're like, we're not paying you. Oh, come on. What do you mean not paying me? I'm going to take you to court. He goes, take us to court. So they go to the court. The judge hears the case. And he says, he was a wise judge. And he says... Well, doctor, you caused damage to both of your patients. And therefore, I conclude that you have to undo the process. You have to make the blind man, the, uh, the one that sees blind, and uh, the, one that, uh, the one that's deaf, or used to be deaf, you have to make him deaf again. And they won't have to pay you. So initially the two guys heard, I don't have to pay, sure. But then when they heard, wait, wait, you're going to make me blind again? You're going to make me deaf again? They started uh, protesting. No, 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 your highness. No, 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 what are you doing? No, 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 what are you talking about? I want to see. I want to hear. I want to see. Ah, says the judge. Oh, so now you want to see. Now you want to hear. You just said you don't want to because you're unhappy because your wife because of this. So this shows that in reality, now that you have the vision, now that you have the ears, you want it, and therefore you have to pay the full price. The fact that your wives are a problem, that has nothing to do with the doctor. And that's what the Magid Mivduvna says to his, to, to, to the Gaumi Vilna, to his Rav, and he says, that's the analogy of everything that you said. A person can say all he wants, I didn't ask to be here, I didn't want to be here, I didn't this, I didn't that. It doesn't make a difference. Once you're here, you want to be here. And don't let the Yitzhara convince you that you won't have to pay a judgment after you die. And that's what Rav Vigdo Miller brings in his Sefer Torah Vigdo on page 47, where a person must have an image of what is in Gehenom, because otherwise, how could he feel that Gehenom, what Gehenom is? And therefore the fire gives a person an image of what it is, now, in the past, says Rav Vigdo Miller, Yeshiva didn't speak about Genom, only about Gan Eden. He's talking about the previous generation before him. Why? Because the respect towards the generation's Torah scholars was at a terrible shape. There was a lot of disrespect towards anybody that was learning Torah. They would literally make fun of them and torment them. Anyone that would learn Torah, they caused them a lot of damage. So to recruit new students to the yeshiva was much more difficult. It wasn't a matter of money. It wasn't a matter of uh, you know location. It was a matter of simply convincing people to continue learning Torah because once you learn Torah, you're going to be disrespected by everybody. Because they were viewed as losers and as uh, this and as that. So in order to convince the Bachurim and the yeshiva... To learn Torah, the rabbis would teach them about Gan Eden in order to encourage them. But today, says Rav Victor Miller, we don't have that problem of disrespect towards Torah scholars. I wish they'd speak about Genom in all of the yeshivot. I wish, he says. When a person sees a fire... 
This is all the words of Rav Vigdor Miller, Rabotai. This is word for word what Rav he said. Anytime that I'm adding, I tell you exactly what I'm adding. When a person sees a fire, he must think of the fire of Gehenom, that's 60 times hotter. If he touches something hot, and it burns himself, he must think that in Gehenom it's much hotter. And this is the real purpose and intention of the creation of fire by Hashem. Why did Hashem create fire? It's not for the purpose of warming things up or creating, uh, bringing light, but rather to teach you what Gehenom is after you see it or after you get burnt. Meaning after you see fire or you get burned by fire, you'll now know what Gehenom is. But since Hashem created it for that purpose, He also enabled us to use it for other beneficial purposes like cooking and a barbecue and other things. But really the main purpose of fire is to teach us Yirat Shemayim. Up to here, Rav Vigdumela. Now, Rabotai, when a person says, I'm the Talmud of Rav Vigdumela, or he says, I'm learning most of my Torah from Vigdumela, you have to understand what you're saying. First, the Mishnah in Masechet Avot says, first chapter, make yourself a Rav in order to eliminate doubt. Anyone who does not have a Rabbi, they have a very, very serious problem. So you have to have a Rabbi. But whoever the Rabbi is that you have, that you're learning from, you must follow everything he says. And not just pick and choose, oh wait, I like this Shulim about Geinom. I like his shulim about, uh, you know, about bitachon. I like his shulim about uh, this. But his shulim about Shabbat, where he says you have to keep it, not so much. His shulim about, uh, you know, how you have to be, uh, have shalom bayit, not so much. You can't pick and choose. Why? Because the Mishnah in Masechet, the, uh, in uh, the Gemara, in Masechet Rosh Hashanah, page 14a, on the bottom over there. Says, the kula de bet shemay, the kula de bet hilel rashau. Someone that's looking for the leniencies of bet shemay on the same topic, and he's also looking for the leniency of bet hilel rashau. Meaning, he's not a, he's not picking sides. He doesn't want to be just bet shemay. Just have this rabbi. He doesn't want to have just that rabbi. He wants to have whatever fits him. Today he listens to someone that says the truth. But as soon as he talks about punishment, he changes channel. And he goes to somebody else that talks nice. He goes to synagogue. He asks the rabbis all the questions. As long as the rabbi gives him the answers that he wants, he's my rabbi. The second that the rabbi says that, by the way... You know, the wig that your wife wears, you know, it comes from idolatry. You have to convince her somehow with love and affection and attention that she has to put a real kisui roshe, like Sarai Menu. Sarai Menu didn't wear a wig. Not a short one, not a long one. You have to convince her. Your wife has to be modest. You have to learn Torah. He comes home, he says, Honey, today he wasn't my rabbi. I'm gonna start listening to the rabbi you uh, you watch on, uh, on online. What did he say? He, he, what did he say last week? It's a little weird. Oh, he said to smoke drugs because that's how you're getting close to God. Yeah, yeah, that sounds okay. I'm not gonna do the drug part, but I like that kind of rabbi. He's uh, open-minded. The Gemara says Rashau, wicked. Why? He's only looking for leniencies. He's looking for leniencies. Can't look for leniencies. Sometimes the rabbi is gonna be lenient, but sometimes he's gonna be strict. Either way, he's your rabbi, that's what you go with. You can't pick and choose. Same concept with people that say, oh, yeah, I love Rabbi the Miller. I never knew he talked about Gainom so much. I never knew all these horrible things. And you have to actually work on Im- imagining Gainom. Well, now you know. And if you are going to continue calling yourself a student of 
Avigdor Miller, this is something you have to do. To get yourself to have, really, you got your mind. And not just read his holy Torah like it's a newspaper or some uh, comic book. Furthermore, in a sefer called Torah Tavigdo, in the second chapter, page 38, the Rav brings the Gemara in Maseret Baobatra, page 10, where it says that when you give tzedakah to a poor, needy person, it saves you from the judgment of Genom. And the Rav says, our holy sages taught us proper ashkafa, proper ideology, that when we see a poor person, there's no such thing as running away from him, heaven forbid, but rather chase him as he is like an angel that'll save you from a massacre. Meaning when you have somebody coming to ask for charity, there's a needy person, poor person, there's a charitable cause that you know is a legitimate cause and not one of these scams that's out there. Instead of saying, oh, come on, I just made this. I already donated. I already this. Oh, this guy again with the money. Never do such a thing, says Rav Domela. Why? If you realize what the Torah says and you believe in the Torah, you'll know that this charitable opportunity for you to give money to, that's going to save you from getting home. That's like Hashem sent you an angel to save you from a massacre. And you say, oh man, this angel again. And to clarify further, Rav Ephraim Kachlon, our dear Rav says, without such an imagery of understanding who really is the one that receives here the benefit, being the giver is the one that receives the benefit, a person really can never justify wanting to give. He may give, but he doesn't want to give. You know, many times people give because they feel like peer pressure. They saw other people in the community give. They know that it's a mitzvah to give. They read something about it to give. But in reality, it hurts them. They don't really want to give. Ah, oh, I worked so hard for the money. I have to give 10%? Oof, come on. Maybe a, uh, what about if groceries? Can I use my groceries as part of that 10%? What about the uh, air conditioning bill? You know, it's phonic Shabbat. Can I use that for uh, Maser? When they start creating all types of nonsense in order to justify not giving more. They don't really like to give. Even if they give, they don't really like to give. Sometimes they give, but they give like... Not so much. They try to do the minimum requirement. Uh, Ephraim says, when a person understands what Rabbi Victor Miller here said, that Hashem sent you an angel that could save you from a massacre. No different than the massacre that happened less than two weeks ago to our brothers and sisters. That staka that you gave could save you from that massacre. It's like Hashem sent you an angel to save you. And you say, ah! So when a person realizes this, he wants to give. Who doesn't want a uh, private angel? And it's a mistake to say that such teachings about Gehenom are not for this generation. Mistake of all mistakes. It's heretical. Why? Because one of the 13 principles of faith is that our Torah will never change. It's not only heretical against the entire Torah, it's heretical against Rav Victor Miller himself. This is the foundation of his teachings. It's literally in every book. Even the next book that really was known as something that the Rav went and delved into science and really opened up the reader's mind, show him how a Talmud Chacham is not just Talmud Chacham in, you know, which, uh, which is the meat dish and which is the uh, dairy dish and uh, how to bring a sacrifice to the Beit HaMikdash that we're still waiting for. No, no, no. Talmud Chacham knows... A lot about a lot. In a sefer called Le'an, which translates to, to where? In page 161, question 509. The Rav talks about Christians being idolaters and hypocrites. And then he summarizes this section. He says, what will be their end? And he says, they're accursed 
to inherit Gehenom several times. And that'll be their end. Even if you see that they benefit from this world and they have positions of power in this world, the end, they're cursed to go to Gehenom. Why? Because of how they serve idol, how they're uh, hypocrites, and so on and so forth. Here he mentions Gehenom. It's a complete, factual, without hesitation. And next, in the Sefer O'Olam, 6th chapter, page 50, talks about regarding a sinner who does tshuva. And he says, it's not so simple to do tshuva, meaning to repent, as this person will have to suffer in this world and even have some time spent in Gehenom for some of his sins. But in the end, He'll be cleansed of his sins. Except the one sin that will never be forgiven. And that is the sin of Bitul Torah. Bitul Torah is wasting time. Instead of learning Torah, doing things that are not necessary, not needy. It's not like you're working or you're spending uh, time with uh, your wife that you need to or kids. No, you just... Uh, watching all types of nonsense on YouTube or on TikTok or, or uh, doing all types of things that instead of learning Torah, be told Torah. The Rav says, that's an unforgivable sin. And Tshuva doesn't help that sin. And he's basing it on the, the Talmud Yerushalmi in Masechet Chagiga in chapter 1, Alakha number 7, that says, Hashem forgave idolatry, immorality, and murder, but he did not forgive be told Torah. Tia Rabbi Vigno Miller simply tells a person, yeah, listen, you do tshuva, it's good, depends on the level of tshuva, average tshuva, you're still going to have to suffer and gain a little bit, but eventually you're going to go, and you're going to be in Ganed, and you're going to be good. Unless you made the sin of Bitul Torah. Then you have a problem. You have a very serious problem. Don't waste time. Time is a very, very valuable as asset. Furthermore, in page 215, same book, Olam, the Rav says, even the punishment of Gehenom has a role. As the sentence of the wicked among Am Yisrael is 12 months, as is their, it's their opportunity to be cleansed and be purified through their suffering. Just to clarify for anyone that hasn't watched the film we made called Gehenom, where we clarify what does it mean the wicked among Israel that suffered 12 months, Number one, the 12 months is referring to a, uh, the, um, a place rather than a, a time frame. Uh, that's what the Malchu says. But also, the 12 months is that he's referring to people that are wicked, but that are still considered part of Am Yisrael. Meaning, we're not talking about a Mechalel Shabbat or a person that wastes seed or people that have Din Karet that uh, removes them from uh, Klal Yisrael, like idolaters or Mechalel Shabbat and so on. We're talking about a person that you know, made some sins, it's considered has more sins than mitzvot, but is not outside of the category of Am Yisrael. He's still considered Amitecha. So their sentence can be the 12 months. But anyone that has made these bigger sins, their sentence is much longer. Needless to say, in some cases, it's forever. So the Ramban, the, the, uh, the uh, Rav Victor Mello says that here we see, even among those people, the punishment in Genom has a positive purpose that's being used to cleanse those people so they can go and be cleaned altogether. But then he elaborates on the following page, on 216, and he brings the Ramban. And he says that the Ramban writes in the Igeret Ramban that he sent to his son, that anyone that expresses anger, all types of genom take over him. Which means that there are several different types of Gehenom, meaning there's several different types of chambers and sentences there. Not everybody gets the same sentence or the same chamber. And he gives examples, such as the Gehenom for someone who does not pray, or doesn't pray appropriately, or speaks during the prayer, or someone that's a scorner. You know, these people like to make jokes about everything, including the Torah. And there's even a special Gehenom for those people who cheat people, 
You cheat in business, cheat on their wives, people that cheat. And all types of Gehenom takes over the angry person. Why? Because through his anger, he makes many, many sins which connect him to all of these different chambers. Through anger, he ends up cheating somebody. Through anger, he ends up a, uh, 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 not praying. Through anger, he ends up being making fun of people, embarrassing people, and so on and so forth. Anger brings a person to many sins. And therefore, the Rabban says to his son, control your anger. And Rabbi Victor Miller says, not just control your anger, remove it from your heart, like the name of the book. In the, next, in the next section, same book, Olam, page 239, the Rav says, the fire of Genom was lit inside the heart of Hitler in Machshimo to influence his actions against the Jewish people. Meaning he literally had like a fire of Genom, evil, inside his heart, Causing him to have unbearable hatred towards the Jews. Anyone that wants to know more details about that can see a shiur by Rav Yosef Ben Porat, who uh, talk, brings many, many different proofs of how Hitler was uh, possessed. He sold his, uh, sold his soul to the Satan. But anyway, Rav Victor Miller says, this Hitler, Yimach Shimo, would sit there, drunk, with his head in his hands, murmuring all types of curses against a person who employed a Jew. Like he hated the Jews so much that literally there was a fire of Genom burning inside him. This is, of course, figuratively speaking. In page 130 in the same book, he says again that the tztaka to the needy saves you from Gehenom. In page 178 in Olam, he tells us some critical instructions for Chinuch. Many parents contact me and say, listen, some of your shuim are scary. Should my kids watch them? Now the truth is, the answer is always yes. Why? Because look at what Rabbi Victor Miller says. Regardless of what shiur it is, whether it's shiur about genom, wasting seed, or it's bitachon and nice, beautiful things, stories, regardless, shiur is for everybody. Why? Because fundamental teachings. It says the Rabbi Vigdor Miller in Olam, page 178. At a young age, it's very important to teach a child the foundation that there is gan eden and then there's genom. There's a reward. And then there's a punishment. That way, the foundation of Judaism will be engraved into his brain and turn into this basic opinion. Or else, something like Mickey Mouse, or worse, will end up getting into him. Because heaven forbid, if this gets there first, it'll become much more difficult to clean that out of his mind and teach him about Moshe Rabbeinu and Mount Sinai. In so many words, teach your children about reward and punishment, including Genom. Of course, everyone in their level, everyone is going to understand their neshama is going to be able to absorb certain information. You don't need to go into the details of the chambers and what happens to people, but certainly the fire, certainly punishment is more than enough for more little, most little kids. And Rav Yudom says, it's necessary for you to do so if you want your kids to be connected to the Torah, connected to Hashem. Or else, Mickey Mouse and materialism is going to control their life. And here he's talking about children, young, young children, because he's talking about, look at the, what he's, he's not saying, oh, either you teach your kids about Genom or uh, basketball will take over. Or, uh, no, no, he's talking about little kids, like, as soon as they're able to communicate, they're three, they're four, they're five, they're six, they're at a time where they're starting to become a person. At that time, you already have to teach them there's reward and punishment. And as they grow up, more details are added. 
And the Rav says in the next page 179 that even an atheist that's laying down and is near is literally about to die can get to a point where he thinks about who knows, maybe there is a Gehenna. And just to make sure, he says the Shema Yisrael. Because he argues to himself, where well, even if there isn't a Olam Abba, I won't lose out by saying the Shema Yisrael, which he never said during his life. So why should I take the risk and not say it? Meaning that he thinks that at least I'll benefit if I say Shema Yisrael, even though he was an atheist his whole life. But what gets him to even think like that? The potential punishment that's about to confront him. In a sefer called Lev Avigdo, page 21, where it's referring to what the Gemara brings in Masechet Gitin, where Onkelos made a uh, seance before he converted to Judaism. And he brought three wicked people, one of them being Bil'am. And Bil'am, when he was when Onkelos asked him, who are the important people in heaven? And he says, the Jewish people. They're the important ones. They're the leaders there. In the world of truth. And he says, where are you? He says, I'm in Gehenna. And he gives them the details of his horrible suffering that he has. So Onkelos asked him, should I convert to Judaism? And Bil'am says, no. Don't convert. But rather... Go and torment the Jewish people because if you torment them and you'll be your, their enemy, you'll at least benefit from this world. Even though you'll end up in the same place as me as in Genom. Now this doesn't make any sense until what Rabbi Vigna Miller clarifies. And he says, even after 1300 years of suffering in Genom and in knowing that Am Yisrael is the important nation in heaven, Bil'am still could not be separated from his evil wickedness and hatred of Am Yisrael. And this is actually part of the punishment of Gehenna as the sin gets mixed into the soul. And in regards to the Gemara in Masechet Nedarim in page 8b, where it says that there is no Gehenna in the uh, Olam Abba, which is referring to really the resurrection, because there... Hashem will take the sun out of its shell once there's the resurrection after Mashiach comes. Hashem will take the sun out of its shell and the tzaddikim, the righteous people, will be healed by it while the reshaim, the wicked, will be burned. And says the Rav, and the weak-minded, meaning the wicked people, will have suffering from this light of truth. When this light of truth shines on them, it'll create suffering that's the same type of suffering as Gehenom. But the healthy-minded people, the ones that have learned Torah and fixed themselves, will benefit greatly from the same exact big light. And in page 136 of the book of Leva Vigdo, the Rav says that if people would be allowed to see what happens to a wicked person, a sinner, who di- after he dies? Who would even sin? And regarding the reward of Gan Eden or the, or the suffering of Genom, who's foolish enough to forsake the word of Hashem? Because Hashem allowed free choice, people are permitted to be skeptical, but they're not allowed to stay that way. You're in this world in order to find the truth, to have Yerat Shemaim. But the reason why people don't have this inclination of the truth naturally is because of the freedom of choice, because if they really knew the truth, and he elaborates further, actually says that if they knew even the significance of their soul, they would never desire anything of this world. Furthermore, in the book Le'an, in question 731, which is on page 224, the Rav says that when people, when do people begin believing in Genom? Even without a Shil Torah, even without watching the Genom film. 
When do people believe about Gainum? When they see evil people torment the weak and the innocent righteous people and get away with it. So even if this person never learned Torah, never believed Torah, never nothing, but as soon as he sees the Hamas terrorists torment the Jewish people, do all the things that they did, immediately every normal human being thinks there must be a reward for this person that was killed, that was tormented, that was tortured. There must be a reward. There some must be a God that's going to reward him for this. And there must be a punishment unlike anything of this world for these murderers. Here of Vigdor Miller tells us something literally like as if he's telling us today after discovering what happened to us two weeks ago. In the last couple of weeks, every normal human being started believing in Gainam. Why? There must be a punishment for these people. Forget about they're going to die, you know, the army. Forget about that. that, that cannot, that's not enough of a punishment for what they did. It's not enough. Anyone that saw the pictures, anyone that saw those things, It's not enough for punishment. Blowing up, it's not enough. There must be something worse. And that's what Arun Victor Miller says. The natural brain understands that there is a reward for the righteous and a punishment for the wicked. And therefore, we learn here that on one end, we have a horrible thing that happened to us a couple of weeks ago, but the same token, it created a spiritual awakening that also got many people to the point of thinking about Ganem. Which Rav Victor Miller mentioned literally in every one of his books as a foundational teaching. You must teach yourself to the point of imagery at all times. Use your five senses to constantly, constantly serve a Kadosh Bahu, including thinking about fire as this is Genom. Teach your kids this and work on yourself because without this, nothing will stop you from being a sinner. Nothing will stop you from abandoning the straight path. So when you're thinking about what happened, when we got attacked a couple of weeks ago, on one end, you're thinking about good, create a spiritual awakening. Furthermore, it's supposed to create a spiritual awakening in you. How could it create a spiritual awakening in you? Look at what happened to those victims and know that Genom is much, much worse. And therefore, we'll finalize this by the words of Rav Ephraim Kachlon. He summarizes everything what, of what the Rav Vigdo Miller taught us here. That if you are Talmud of Rav Vigdo Miller, either do what he says by publicizing and supporting the film that we made called Genom that has 172 Torah sources from all spectrums of the Torah, from the Tanakh, from the Zohar Kadosh, from the Gemara, from the Mishnah, from the Shulchan Aruch, from the Rishonim, from the Achronim, from Hasidut. All aspects of Judaism are mentioned in there, 172 Torah sources. It's not simply a scary movie, but rather exactly what Rabotenu Akdushim, like Rabbi Victor Miller, taught us to do. Not only to learn the topic, not only to learn the sources, but literally have an imagery so we can stay on the right path. So one that says, I want to be a Talmud of Rav Vigdor Miller, or I am a Talmud of Rav Vigdor Miller, what are they going to do? They're going to watch, they're going to publicize, they're going to support, they're going to do everything possible to take advantage of the current spiritual awakening that we have in the world today and try to make sure that everyone has an idea of what Genom is because right now they're thinking about it. How could it be that these monsters are not punished? How could it be that Israel is considering stopping the war? How could it be that these people went back, they took hostages? How could it be? 
Once you know about Gehenom, you know, oh, okay, I have nothing to worry about. God will, God will take care of it. El nekamot Hashem, el nekamot fear. The God of vengeance is Hashem. The God of vengeance has arrived. So if one wants to publicize support to get no movie, to get people to watch it, you're doing what Victor Miller would have done. Or on the other hand, it's a different suggestion. You don't want to publicize the get no movie because you're scared to hurt people, little weak hearts people. You don't want to help people do tshuva. No problem. Put your hand in fire and just imagine that lasting for five minutes. Because that's the other suggestion Robert Victor Miller says. Either way, you have to have an imagery. Either way, you have to do something with this information and with these five senses in order for you to understand the very basic foundation of our holy Torah. With that being said, this is just again a small tidbit of what Rav Vigdor Miller taught about the topic of Gehenom. It's mentioned countless other places in his farim and his lectures. But needless to say, this shows a person that perhaps has been reading or watching or hearing some of the words of the Rav and never really heard the foundation of everything that he built his Torah on. Now you know. Now you know that Gdole Israel, this is the way they taught. Because Genom is not only good to believe, it's part of the foundation of Judaism. It's part of the 13 principles of faith. It's part of anyone's life that actually has real Yirat Shemaim. Without it, there is no Yirat Shemaim. Whatever you think is Yirat Shemaim, it simply doesn't exist. And without Yirat Shemaim, certainly there is no such thing as loving Hashem. Because the Yirat comes before the Ava. There is no such thing as Ava before Yirat. So may it be His will that each and every single person, whether they are the Talmud of Victor Miller or they're the Talmud of anyone that teaches real Torah, going to take this information to heart and understand this is necessary not just for you, but for your family, and more importantly, than any other time in history for the world today. For anyone that hasn't watched the film, it'll be good for you to watch it because you'll understand a lot more about what is being said here. And although I've told some people, listen, if you can't handle the imagery, just listen to it. It's information you need to hear, just like a lecture. Apparently, Rabbi Victor Miller would not agree with that suggestion that I've made as far as just listen to it. Because apparently we need the imagery. And Baruch Shekivanu. Thank you again for learning with me. May Hashem bless each and every single one of you with a extraordinary success in acquiring real Yirat Shamaim, knowing the foundation, and therefore staying on the right path, building a, f- a family that all stays and wants to be on the right path, and merits having success in getting the rest of Am Yisrael to get on that same right path. Shabbat Shalom and B'chav B'atzlachat to everyone. Kol Tuf.